another one of the um, foundations of the Republic is in viewing justice, how does justice correspond to indivi the individual in the city? Um, we're going to look now at a larger scale, look at the city, the city of Athens in particular, uh, to see whether what Socrates is saying um, in the Republic with regards to Gyges also meshes uh, when you have more than one person living uh, in a community. But before that, I mentioned before, first part of uh, today, yes, that along with the human cost of the Peloponnesian War, there was a cost of ideas, ideas that were so, sort of shunted aside, that were thrown away because they were too inconvenient. Let me go over them again. First, of course, just, um, was freedom, what we've been studying for the past hour or so. Second of these ideas, um, a concept called metron, M-E-T-R-O-N. Metron, rough translation, corresponds to proper proportion. The Greeks believed that there was a proper proportion to things, what something is supposed to be if it is to be all that it is supposed to be. Um, example of this, of course, if you view Greek architecture, the Parthenon in Athens, uh, if you look at the size, the way it's constructed, there's nothing sort of overdone. It sort of makes sense. There's sort of a symmetry to it. Uh, if one watches the Olympics, um, I, I watch it for boxing, my own sport, plus other sports as well. Uh, when I see the physiques of certain athletes, um, people in track, people in uh, swimming, uh, they're sort of muscular, but they're not sort of overdone one way or the other. Uh, had a, I knew a guy in um, uh, old boy Catholic school in the Philippines who decided one day he wanted to lift weights. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I didn't see him again for under several months, but the, the only problem was he only lifted upper body which meant we went to the beach, uh, it was like a big lollipop, like, you know, it was like all big and like itty bitty legs like down in the bottom, not very proportional. The Greeks are saying that you have to have a proportion to things physically, but not only physically, in the way you behave as well. It is not considered good form to be excessive in things, to lament excessively, to um, perhaps have celebrations excessively as well but to do things in some sort of moderation. Aristotle, of course, will call this the golden mean uh, later on in the uh, Nicomachean Ethics uh, by Aristotle. Um, Metron was one of those ideas that was seen to be inconvenient because after all, if you're going around conquering city-state after city-state, as Athens will try to do, you can't really conquer in moderation. You have to give in to your desires in order to conquer more. Third of these ideas, so we have freedom, uh, Metron, and the last, uh, something you prob you'll probably see has more application to economics, is private property. The Greeks believed in the importance of encouraging people to own private property. They believed that a society in which private property was encouraged was a society wherein people will be more involved in politics, will have more incentive to be involved in politics. Um, I used to teach a class many years ago at my, old, uh, oh, at my college in, in, in San Francisco, a public speaking course where you're supposed to give, up, uh, give presentations. Um, and one of the students in the class um, gave a speech one day. The assignment was to give a speech about what your most ideal work environment will be like in 10, 15 years or so. What is your best sort of you know, job, uh, climate, and uh, situation? This person who was presenting uh, said that, uh, before he gave a speech, he said, you know, I just want to let you guys know I'm a tagger. I'm an old guy, so I thought I put prices on Gap clothing or Foot Locker shoes. It was tagging. Apparently, he was a graffiti artist. Uh, that's what he called tagging. So I said, okay, very interesting. What, what is your presentation? He told us for about 10, 15 minutes about how he'd like to build a school, a university, a college, in which he would teach taggers, future generations of taglings and taggets, uh, the fine arts of tagging, of graffiti, and maybe have that as a successful institution um, where he would impart his skill. Uh, to uh, younger people. I said, great, you know, during the q and I gave applause. Um, small question during the Q&A. When you finally have your school, do you, are you gonna, you gonna rent, you gonna buy? And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's very simple. When you finally have your school where you're teaching all these people how to tag, right? Are, are you gonna rent from somebody else the property or are you gonna buy it and pay for it yourself? So you own the school. And he goes, well, ideally, if I have enough money, I'd like to buy. I said, good, good, good decision. Question number two, once you've bought your school and it's yours, are you gonna let some guy come off the street tag your building? Hell no. Like, time out, boss. You just tagged somebody's building last week. And he goes, it's different. I'm like, why? Well, because now I own it. <laughs> Precisely. The Greeks would say, if you own something, you have something to lose. Nobody's responsible for that but you bought your first car after college, after grad school, scrimped up and saved all that money, 
beat up Honda or, or Hyundai or whatever, or Toyota, first thought in your head, I'm gonna do donuts with this thing. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go really, really fast, get tickets and you know, park, no. First thought probably in your head is, you know what, it, it's not a great car anyway, but I'm gonna try to preserve it as best I can. It's mine, I have to take care of it. Private property, another idea that is seen to be inconvenient during this war between Athens and Sparta. It's a civil war. And why is it inconvenient? Uh, you, you can't really believe in private property if you're taking your army and you're taking over somebody else's city. That idea has to be thrown away. Here's what Athens decides. Uh, Athens, by the way, is seen by the other Greek city-states as one of the, how should we say, uh, one of the leading causes of this war is Athens' ambition. Remember, Sparta is primarily farmers, yes? Uh, Sparta are guys who basically stick to the land. Uh, they stick to themselves. They have friends called the Peloponnesian League, but they generally are very conservative politically. The Athenians are much more far-reaching. Athens' power is not on the land. It's on the sea. They're sailors. They're merchants. Therefore, always looking for bigger and bigger markets uh, with which to expand. The Peloponnesian War does not begin with Athens and Sparta, simply fighting with each other. Uh, for the same rule that during the Cold War, you very rarely had uh, an American GI uh, with an M16 rifle and a uh, Soviet soldier with an AK-47 shooting at each other. Very rarely. Why? Two superpowers going at each other, the cost is too high. So what usually happens? Smaller friends of the big guy fight other smaller friends of the other big guy and eventually drag the two big guys into the fight. This is called satellite warfare, where the smaller satellites basically pick fights and eventually the two powers are dragged into this. Athens comes up with a strategy during this, uh, this struggle. It says to itself, we are not going to fight Sparta on land. The Spartans like to fight hoplite battles, yes? Large shields, you've seen this in movies or documentaries. Long ash spears, nine foot in length. We crash these walls against each other and the tougher guy will win. Athenians say, although we outnumber the Spartans manpower wise, the Spartans, that's their best. They're, they're the best at that kind of fighting. Why do we play to their strength? We have to play to our strength, which is our navy. So Athens says, we're gonna wall ourselves off. We'll tell all our allies to come within the city and we will send our navy to conquer all of Sparta's smaller allies, one polis after the other. And at the end of the day, Sparta will be left alone. No supplies, no more manpower, surrounded. This is death by strangulation, in a sense. It's a slow strangulation, but essentially that is Athens' strategy. One of the examples of this strategy is found in your readings. Let's, fi uh, let's find this um, collectively. Uh, it should be after the Ring of Gyges. You should see uh, on this handout, it's uh, 431 BC, the history of the Peloponnesian War. Do you guys see that? Okay, we're actually gonna, take, we're gonna tackle this a little bit differently. Instead of reading this quietly all together, I'm gonna pick a few paragraphs. This is a dialogue, of course, and we'll try to read it aloud, just to give it a little bit more flavor. Let me give you a little primer what is happening in this situation, in this scenario. Uh, this is one of the examples of Athens conducting its strategy, its strategy of overtaking Sparta's allies one by one. The ally in this case is an island called Milos, M-E-L-O-S. The Melians who live in Milos are former Spartans who branched out and colonized this island. They have their own city, state, and civilization. They're no longer Spartans, but they are descended from Lacedaemonia or Sparta. The Athenians show up on the Melian shores with approximately 3,000 hoplites, archers, infantrymen, uh, and they come to the Melians in typical Greek fashion before the conquest begins. Let's talk for a little bit. Let's discuss. We're Greeks. We're very rational. Let's sit down and let's present our case. The Athenians will present their case first. Here's what the Athenians are saying. Melians, we're not here just to destroy you. We'd like you to be part of the club. The Athenian club. It's a pretty cool one. Uh, it's growing. It's, it's expanding. It has great retirement benefits. If you simply join the club, there will be no conflict. We'll, we'll all go home, we'll all be happy. Of course, if you choose not to, the cost will be very high. We will see what the cost is at the end of the article. Um, we're gonna pick a couple of, um, a couple of uh, parts of the dialogue to read aloud. Let's see, on page one. Okay, page one, you guys should see the, uh, it's the paragraph beginning with Athenians. It's second to last um, paragraph, beginning with for ourselves. Do you guys see that? For ourselves. Volunteer for that paragraph. Please. <coughs> For ourselves, we shall not trouble you with spe specious pretenses. 
either of how we have a right to our empire because we overthrew the meat, or are now attacking you because, <clears throat> because of wrong that you have done us, and make a long speech which would not be believed. And in return, we hope that you, instead of thinking of influences, I mean influence, in, sorry, instead of thinking to influence us by saying that you did not join the Lacedaemonians, Lacedaemonians, <laughs> although they're colonists, or that you have done us no wrong, will aim at what is feasible, holding in view the real sentiments of both of us both. <clears throat> Since you know as well as we do that right, as the word goes, is only in question between equals in power, while the strong do what they it should be can. Can the weak suffer what they must? Excellent. Let's break this paragraph down into two parts. Yes. First part of the paragraph: The Athenians are saying to the millions, "For ourselves, we shall tr not trouble you with specious pretenses." Uh, the Athenians are saying, look, uh, we Athenians are very skilled at speech, after all. Uh, we are known for having great orators. We're not even going to bother. We're not going to try to convince you by our fine words. Neither are we going to try to convince you because we defeated Persia. That's what the Mede is, yes, the Persians, the Medes. We're not going to call on our old exploits of the past to say we're really cool, and that's why you should listen to us. We're not going to use all of those things. Um, there's a very long word called Lacedaemonians. You guys see that middle of the paragraph? Uh, that basically translates to Spartans. It's just a very fancy way of saying Spartans. Um, small aside, when you guys were going to college, I'm guessing you all are going to college right now, did you guys tour, like sort of hang around, go, go to your college to see what it's like, listen to conversations, people you know, walking around? Uh, when I went to my old college in St. John's in Annapolis, um, if you guys, I don't know if you guys have heard, it's four years, uh, Homer through Einstein basically in four years. You're reading all primary texts. No textbooks of anybody else, you're reading the primary authors. Um, freshman year, you have to study translating uh, Attic Greek. Uh, so junior year, medieval French, just because they want to make things hard for you at, at the college. Um, when I was touring around, I sat around the coffee shop just to hear what people talked about, you know, on the free time. It was a coffee shop party, and I saw these two guys walking in front of me, and I eavesdropped, and I heard this one guy say in the middle of a conversation, it's these damn Lacedaemonians. And I thought to myself, coffee shop party, Saturday night, everybody's getting drunk, and they're still complaining about Spartans. Perfect place to go to college. Uh, <laughs> that, that's where I want to go. Um, anyway, that's what Lacedaemonians means. So the Athenians are saying, we're not going to give you all these really cool reasons of why we're doing what we're doing. So what is the reason that the Athenians give for them doing what they're doing? They're saying, we're here to conquer. Go ahead. Because they have a lot more power, and they will just crush them, basically. Excellent. And what line do we see that in? Um, <clears throat> since you know as well as we do that right as the word goes is only a question between equals in power, while the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. Excellent. If you have two competing parties, both with equal amounts of power, then questions such as justice, then questions such as right, morality come into play. By the way, this is very similar to the Ring of Gagis. But if you have an imbalance of the power, the Athenians are saying, don't even bother with these questions. When you have an imbalance of power, what only matters is power. And because you're weak, you're not a pond weakling on the beach, you can't lift the, bench, uh, the barbell off the bench press, to save your life, then you gotta take it. Whereas me, the teens are saying, I go to Gold's Gym. Uh, I work out a lot. I'm more, more powerful than you. Therefore, I gotta do what I want. Um, quick question, are the Athenians right? And feel free to read whatever you want into right. Are they wrong? Are they right? Please. Ethically, I would say they're wrong. Practically, I would say that that's often what we see happen. OK. So you separated into two ways of thinking. So ethically, they're wrong. Why? Um, be just because you're stronger, more powerful than someone that does not give you the right um, or make it just that you impose your will on the weaker subject. 
Very good. I would agree. But why isn't it right? Because you have to honor the weaker individual's autonomy. Um, and not only that, but you may not have their best interest in, in mind. Right. Well, the Athenians are saying, look, if you just come along quietly, I'm looking out for your best interests. You'll be alive. <laughs> but they're not looking out for their best interests. Well, how come? I mean, they're because, saying. Because they're saying, come live under us, and you don't get to rule or have the say on how you live your life. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we'll kill you. It's, it's good to be alive. <laughs> Is it? In this scenario, it's a very good question. The, the millions are balancing these things, yes? Okay. Excellent, yes. What are we taking away? Because it's not a fair choice to say, would you like to join our empire? And if there's no real consequences, or direct consequences right. of not joining it, instead of saying, we'll invade you either way. Excellent, but when you say fair, what does that mean? It's not a fair choice. It's uh, kind of a loaded choice. One two. One two. Can you? I would argue, almost argue that they are wrong because they are a satellite of Sparta, and they could ultimately be more powerful with the backing that you know they. they who's who's wrong? The the millions, or the Athenians? The Athenians, the Athenians are wrong. We can just crush you because we're so much bigger and more powerful. You know they're, okay. they're scared in the first place. They don't even want to right. go right to the doorstep. Of so the, the Athenians are wrong in what light? In a moral light, in a practical light? In a practical light, oh, I think. Okay, so they're making a mistake, a tactical mistake. Yeah, they could be. They, they could, could be. be. Right. Say, you know what, no, and then like hit up the spark. Got it. And here comes the cavalry, and that's very good. Hand up. Okay. Are the Athenians right? Is force, please. Well, I mean, I think that if by destroying the millions, you're Right. And so that, in a way, is right for Athenian citizens. So it is good for the Athenians to do what they're doing? I don't know that we have enough information to judge. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so it, could, it could be a good decision because for the Athenians, if they're trying to limit what the Spartans may do, so might as well get this out of the way. I mean, you say that they're fighting a war, so yes. the Spartans are attacking Athenians. If the Athenians find this is the way to stop right. the So they're in it to win it, right? I mean, you're not, you're not in it to, to tie. You, you want to win the war. And this is a, a way that you could win the war. Therefore, it is right for them to do it. Well, if this is going to maybe prevent the cost of death from rising, if you yes. have fewer deaths by taking away the choice of millions, if you're going to have a lower death toll, then that could be right. That's, that's exactly what William Tecumseh Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant said in, in the American South. Uh, we're doing this right now because the Civil War, we don't want it to be. You guys know total body count American Civil War? Uh, 600,000-ish? Uh, more than half a million, yes. Grant and Sherman are basically telling Abraham Lincoln behind closed doors, if this thing goes further, you want it to be a million? It, to, to not have that happen, we need to do a couple things. That may not be that savory, but perhaps it's right in this situation. Interesting point. Hand up. Hand up. Uh, well, I was just going to say, after the Athens area decides that they're going to fight this war with Sparta and they're going to the uh, Milos, isn't it the ethically correct or like morally right decision to offer them this if they already <laughs> decided right. they're going to take them over? Right. Might as well offer them peace instead of just going in there not sure. Well, the thing is, could just go in there and start killing people. So, but the fact that they're offering a way out is right. At, at this point, you know, after they already decide they're taking over Milos. <laughs> Right. Like, but you, you could argue the entire war and the whole concept of taking over Milos yeah. is wrong, and mm -hmm. I would agree with you. But once that's already decided, which it seems to be, then this offering is better than just killing them. Humpty Dumpty's already fallen down. At least I have some super glue. You know, it, it's already cracked in that sense, yes? It, it's not, bad things already happened. So this is the least bad. Is, the, is least bad the same thing as right? I, 
in this situation, <laughs> lesser evil is far greater. I I rather than greater evil. Yeah. Uh, point taken. Very good. One two. Um, from a practical standpoint, for the Athenians, there's also the risk of blowback. If you do this to one of the states, then you're gonna all the other states are gonna see this, and they're gonna want to side with Sparta because they'll see that the Athenians are coming no matter what. The risk of blowback in that other poli uh, other city states and polices might say. Look at the Athenians, how bad they're being. So we have to rise up against them. Or just join the Spartans. Right. But then again, the Athenians are also performing the calculus in their head that says, if we do this overwhelmingly, then the other potential turn of mind would be, it's not even worth fighting them. Right? So it's a, it's a risk we're balancing. Great point. Yes? I was just going to say, like, well, I mean, for the Athenians, it makes, or if I was in the Milo, or Milos, right? Um, the, uh, it would make more sense to fight, because then you have, you slow down the Athenians, mm -hmm. um, where if you just bow down to the Athenians, the Ath I mean, it's essentially telling all the islands, other islands to do the same. Um, you know, if they bow down, right. then we should, and you know, it's kind of a uh, domino effect, where if they stood up, well, then that slows down the Athenians, at least temporarily. And so the Athenians are risking, I would say, more in a war than, well, kind. I don't really know where my thoughts are going, but uh, um, just kind of like the, it, it's so definitely more of a risk to the Athenians in terms of their war path if they have to right. stop in Milos. It would be, it's obviously much more, ex, it's a huge expedition yes. for the uh, Athenians if they can right. get them just to bow down. Very good, excellent. Yes. So they're risking a lot. Point to Kanda? I was just going to kind of play off what you were saying. Um, if you're an alien, would you want your family land and be the point of like the, the blunt of it you know you're I think it. I think the, the choice has been removed from me though at that point I don't have a choice of whether or not my land is the heart of it it, it is right. it is whether or not the Athenians my best bet would be I'm going to tell them no and hope the Athenians move on to the next island <laughs> but <then not> <laughs> <laughs> right. that's a lot of hoplites over there <laughs> right. but that, that choice has been taken away from me I have no choice in what the Athenians do I have a choice in myself I don't want that, obviously, but my best bet would be to sit here and fight and then hope for the best that they just kind of move on. <laughs> well put, yes. Well, they're, they're being offered the same thing that the Persians offered them, right? Oh, nice. Interesting. Okay, so explain. Okay, and just the Greeks decided that they had enough power to withstand the, the war with the Persians. In this situation, the millions need to decide whether they think they have a chance to survive a war right. or whether bowing to the east is better, you know? Good point, okay. Let's see what, look at what the uh, millions respond with. Uh, let's turn to page, this should be, uh, let's see. Okay, this is on page three, so the uh, third page of the reading. Rather short paragraph. From the million side, let's see. Uh, second paragraph, beginning with millions, you may be sure. Do you guys see that on page three? Volunteer for that one? Please. You may be sure that we are well that we are as well aware of you of the difficulty of contending against your power and fortune, unless the term be equal. But we trust that the gods may grant us fortune as good as our, as good as yours. And we are just men fighting against unjust, and that what we want in power will be made up by the alliance of the Lacedaemonians, who are bound, if only for very shame, to come to the aid of their king. Our confidence, therefore, after all, is not so utterly irrational. Very good. What do the millions respond with? What is this uh, paragraph? What is it? Uh, how is it a response to Athens? What are they saying? They're obviously not saying, yes, we're going to give in. They're kind of saying no. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that they're ultimately saying it's like, I mean, what they're ultimately saying is like that, you know, we do have allegiance with. Um, the Spartans, right. and so you know we're not just some little nothing that you can stomp on. Sure. And so because we're allied with Sparta, they're going to come and help us. That's why we're going to hold out. Okay, that is that's, that's one part of that paragraph. What is the other part? Yes. They also want to hold the moral high ground. Uh, uh, since we are just men fighting against unjust, their argument is it's the private property idea that you were talking about from the beginning. You know, this is our land. We've been here. I think they said earlier it was like 700 years or something. 
and you guys are going to try to take this away from us. You know, this is both our honor and our moral code saying that we're going to stand and fight and protect what is really ours. Very good. Uh, really quickly, w what is moral high ground? How high is it? <laughs> I, love, I, I agree with you, but I'm just saying, what is it? it it's, a, it's a figure speech, like the was saying. It's something where they are morally superior, or they're making the case that they're morally superior to the Athenians because uh, the Melians, I don't know the history of the war, but it doesn't seem that they instigated hostilities against the Athenians. Right. The Athenians came right. to their mm -hmm. island right. to kill, enslave, take over their island somehow. And for that reason, that the Athenians are more despicable morally than the Melians who are just trying to defend what is rightfully their like, property right. It's a great point. Um, here's the interesting thing about moral high grounds, yes? If I say, I will not lower myself to do something, or I will not choose to do this option right here, because I see it as an immoral, an immoral choice, yes? A, a wrong choice, an ethically wrong choice. What if I say that and now begin saying, I didn't choose the wrong choice. I'm so much more superior to you. In virtue, can there be also vice? Gluttony, wrath, greed, among all of the seven deadlies, the first and foremost is pride. It's sort of like the gateway sin. It gets you to all the other ones. And here's the catch. When we begin saying, look at me, I am so virtuous. The needle between virtue and vice, ironically, you're all the way over here. You're virtuous. Yeah, good. You're a good person. But the moment you begin saying, look at me, I deserve all these. There goes the needle. So the millions have to be careful. They can claim the moral high ground. But if you, do, if you do so in such a way to elevate yourself upon a new high ground, we tend to position ourselves to fall. Yes, that's, where you, that's the only way to go once you're high, essentially. Hand up earlier. Okay. The millions are arguing we are not going to give in because heaven views us as better. Our cause is better than yours. By the way, as you mentioned earlier about the Persians, think of the millions in this paragraph holding up a very large old bronze mirror, showing that to the Athenians and saying, guys, look at yourselves. 50 years ago, you and our big brothers, the Spartans, you were our role models. You stood against all this stuff that Persia was trying to foist upon us. But here's the irony. 50 years later, Look at you guys. You're exactly what you fought. Old saying from Friedrich Nietzsche is, one should be very careful combating monsters, lest one become one as well. The Athenians, it seems, at their moment of greatest triumph. By the way, Athens is at the apex of power. There's nobody more powerful than Athens at this point. Think of the uh, word I mentioned earlier. Tragedy, you guys know the definition of what tragedy means as an art form? Tragedy in a classical sense involves two things. One, great emotional suffering, what the Greeks will call pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S, where we get empathy and sympathy. Second thing that uh, delineates a tragedy, it is the narrative or the story of a fall, a descent. If you read any tragedy, whether it's Oedipus Rex, whether it's the Antigone, whether it's Lear or Macbeth, you always have the main character begin the story at a high point, and at the end of the story, he or she is brought low, at a low point. The Greeks, here's the irony, and again, irony, by the way, another Greek concept. The irony in this situation, during the golden age of Greece, before this war begins, the Greeks will introduce us to this art form of tragedy. But during the war, the Greeks would actually show us a tragedy. 
one could argue very strongly that Athens, at its moment of greatest power and its height, is the most tragic figure. Socrates would say uh, in another dialogue called the Gorgias, something that was very hard for me to understand as an 18-year-old kid fresh from Manila, uh, going to school in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, Socrates would say it is better to suffer a wrong than to do a wrong. Very hard sell for an 18-year-old Filipino kid who's seen a whole lot of people do a whole lot of wrongs and get away with it. So why is it better to suffer it? The millions are making the same argument. We're better than you. You're attacking us. You're trying to take our stuff away. Our cause will be seen higher by heaven. They're using morals, yes? Ethics. They're using this because they have no power. They don't have the power to match Athens. They need to bring something else into the equation. Now, what then do the Athenians say? Very next paragraph. Beginning with Athenians, when you speak. Do you guys see that? When you speak. Uh, volunteer for this paragraph. Please. When you, speak, <clears throat> when you speak of the favor of the gods, we may, be as fair, we may as fairly hope for that as yourselves. Neither our pretensions nor our conduct being in any way contrary to what men believe of the gods or practice, practice among themselves. Of the gods we believe and of men we know that by necessary law of their nature they rule wherever, wherever they can. And it is not as if we were first to make this law or act upon it, at, act upon it when made. We found it existing before us, and shall leave it to exist forever after us. All we do is to make use of it, knowing that you and everybody else, having the same power as we have, would do the same as we do. Thus, as far as the gods are concerned, we have no fear and no reason to fear that we shall be at a disadvantage. Very good. What then do the Athenians respond with in this paragraph? The Athenian, think of this as tennis. The first volley from Athens, yes, force. Backhand response from the Athenians, ethics. And now what is the counter response of the Athenians? How do they respond to this ethical argument? Yes? Um, almost like equality of ethics. Like, um, um, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, everything's relative almost. Interesting. How so? Because what? they're saying, you know, um, that. <coughs> I'm kind of drawing a blank, but I feel that that's what it's stating, right. ultimately. I would agree, yes. I don't have really a fancy word. Basically, they said, if you are in our shoes, you would do the same thing. The right. gods know it. Go. They know the flaw of, of man. The gods know, would know our side is better than yours? Is no, that what they would understand that what are unjust onto you right. is <laughs> not unjust because they understand that we are man. Okay, so the, the gods would be forgiving yes. to what we're doing, even though we're doing bad things. I, I mean, that, I don't like that argument, but yes. That's what they're saying. Yes. Okay, very good. Hand up in the middle. That the true ethics would come from being in the position and not acting. But there, with the millennials, like, desire to not, have, not be invaded isn't an ethical position because they don't have the power to do anything about it or to do anything to others. Right. Okay. I see your point. Yes. To go back to what you were talking about, the uh, kind of like this tether ball situation of go back with power, and then they say, "Well, we have the ethical, moral high ground." Right. But then, and then they respond saying, "Well, this is just how nature works. This mm. is na nature's law, um, and uh, so I mean, natural law. Like, well, yeah, we would have done it in the same position, you know, if you were in the same position." So the Athenians say, "If you were powerful and we were weak, you'd do exactly the same thing we're doing." If the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. OK, very good. What are the Athenians saying about the gods? And here's sort of the rub of the argument in that paragraph. What are they saying about the gods? What do we know about the gods of Greece? In the Trojan War, gods such as Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Apollo, if one reads Homer, play with human lives like they were chess pieces. Oh, I'll make this guy fight that guy right now. I'll help this guy, and I'll kill this one over here. It, it, who is more right between two, these two guys fighting? We don't care, because this is chess for us. This amuses us. We're living forever. It's boring in Olympus. We have to do something. Hand up. And 
so it's the gods, the gods themselves are sort of ruled, ruled by nature, not necessarily by like a divine right. The gods themselves are subject to this law. Or they rule by the law of nature, not by right, or what we consider right. OK, I see what you're saying. Yes? Um, the, those gods were kind of seen like rock stars um, in that time period. OK. And they were flawed, and they were scandalous, and um, they weren't seen as like our conception of the Judeo-Christian God as being this ominous, perfect being. Um, they you know, were able to fall from grace just as a hero, a human hero would be. When the Olympian sky father, Zeus, wants to seduce earthly women, he will transform himself into a bull, Europa, I believe, a swan, Leda, I believe, a golden shower of rain. I don't know how that one works, but um, <laughs> a, a situation uh, with the mother of Perseus. Um, what, is, what are the Athenians saying? They're saying to the millions, bro, the gods who you look upon for moral guidance are just as much Mac Daddies and players as we are. They're no better than we are. Look at them. Look what they do. And here's, here's, here's the rub. They're even worse than we are. Why? Because when the gods do things, they live forever. There's no cost to what they do. Therefore, they can't make a mistake. We were talking about earlier before break. There's no point to a mistake when you can live forever and basically redo it. A do-over, essentially, of whatever act you did. So don't look at them. Interesting, though, that you said flawed. Could you expound on that really quickly? We know the gods are flawed. How? Um, yeah, not, not perfect. <laughs> How do we know the gods are not perfect? Um, because the stories tell us they're not. Right, right. <laughs> sure. I believe the stories too. Uh, very good. But, but the interesting thing, yes, that you bring up is if we know the gods are not perfect, that means that we know what perfection might mean. Well, we can see what their actions are. Right. Um, and we, we, I guess, impose our conception of what's right and what's wrong or what would be the right thing to do or the good thing to do. We impose our conception of right and wrong or we, can, uh, or we impose the conception of right and wrong. Our limited Knowledge. perspective of what we think is the objective right and wrong. Very good. Um, another Platonic dialogue, the Euthyphro, E U T H Y P H R O. Subject of the Euthyphro is what is piety. Socrates asks Euthyphro, Are things right because the gods make it right? Or does right exist separate to whether the gods make it that way or not? In this case, the Athenians are saying, do not look to the gods for guidance because they're pretty bad anyway. They follow the law of nature anyway. So why don't you just give in? Um, I'll sort of give you the quick ending to this story. The Melians are very stubborn. They say ultimately to the Athenians, no, we're not going to surrender. We're going to wall ourselves off, and you can mount a siege if you'd like, but we're not going to give in to you. End of the story, very similar to the end of 300. Someone within the walls of Milos betrays his home city, much like Epialtes at Thermopylae. By the way, Epialtes, the guy who betrays the Greeks at Thermopylae against the, the Persians, you guys saw the movie, yes? Uh, in, in real life, he wasn't like bent over with a big, you know, one eye, that kind of thing. Uh, he was just a goat farmer who wanted gold, essentially a person who sold his own people out for material gain. Very similar concept happens in Milos. When the walls are finally breached, the Athenians seizing the city, physically seizing the city, will do two things. First, all able-bodied men, ear to ear. Women and children sold as slaves. Now, the elephant in the room, obviously, is if you're the millions and you know by the way, that is par for the course. That is not an anomaly. That's what happens in the ancient world when you lose. Uh, in medieval times, much removed from the Greek times, uh, knights in France 
in continental Europe used to bring their sons out into battlefields while the crows were still eating corpses. And they would look at their sons and they would point at those bodies and they would say, son, that right there, that's what happens when you lose. The imperative then is to win. If the millions know that is their fate, the most basic question, why do they resist? If you know you can live comfortably, if you just say yes, why risk this extinction of your polis? And by the way, that's what happens to Milos. We're lucky that you know, Thucydides wrote that story down, because if not, a blip gone basically in world history. So if you're the millions, why say no? Fraud. I'm sorry? Fraud. In? Themselves, their morality. So we believe in ourselves. But, but they think they're better than all the other places Athens has conquered before. Right. So what about them holds, do they hold special? Morality, for sure. They, they right. So we're better, we're more moral, that's, that's the way we're going to fight, in that sense. That's why they refuse to give in. Yeah. Very good. Remember Gyges from the first part of today? When you look at Athens and look what Athens is doing, by the way, Athens essentially snuffs out Milos. Milos is a bump in the road to Athens' conquests, up until the point where Athens loses in the end. Is Athens free? What do you know about freedom? Are they free? No. Very quick, no. How so? Go ahead. Um, because they will have to continue to go on and um, you know, flex their muscle and be the strongest you know, nation right. and conquer and they don't have any other option because if they don't, then they're going to get plowed over. So the Athenians are not free because they are conquering? Because they have no choice but to conquer. They put themselves in a position where they can't get out of it, basically. Interesting. Yes? Yeah. They agree to the ethics which the Melanians put forth. Right. And then they say that they're going to break it. And it's not like they're just saying this in this case, but they're saying it across the board. We're going to expand, even though it's completely against our ethical nature. So, so the Athenians are, you guys know the difference between an amoral act and an immoral act? What is the difference? Amoral is, you don't, it's not, it's without morals, whereas immoral is against the morals. So what, what has to be there for a person to make an immoral act? The moral. They have, to, they have to know. So are the Athenians in this scenario immoral? They know, or the Athenians said we're not even going to talk about it. So by the Athenians saying we're not going to talk about justice or equality, all these really cool things, we're simply going to use force. Does that mean that the Athenians know these things to begin with? Know what rules they're breaking? If a person breaks a rule that the person was not aware existed, yes? Uh, kind of an amoral action. Yes? I think that they understand the ideas, but because of their response with the whole, um, you know, Gods are imperfect themselves, ultimately. Right. They kind of overrode that right. understanding and made it an amoral act because the gods aren't perfect themselves, and so neither are we. So since who we look up, the people we, or the beings we look upon for guidance are not being awfully good anyway, then, bad example, so I'll just do what I want in that scenario, okay? Notice, if you remember the story of Gyges, what happens to make himself turn invisible? He puts on the ring, yes, but what else happens? It's not just the Tolkien, you put on the ring, you become invisible. Gyges is a little bit different. To turn it. There's a bezel on the ring, yes, some sort of device in the ring. Now, perhaps the most important point of the story of Gyges and perhaps the story of the Athenians as well. The direction the bezel is turned for Gagis to turn invisible and hence to become corrupted is when the bezel, read as much metaphor as you can into this, according to Socrates, when the bezel is turned inward. When I am looking only to myself, 
my desires, my needs, my wants, in spite of all else. When I am loving, in a philosophical sense, myself to spite all others. That is pride. The irony, of course, is pride, of pride, yes, as you guys should know, or probably already, already know. The irony of pride is it's actually love with a twist. The twist being is that the love is only diverted towards yourself. The Athenians, at their moment of greatest glory, begin forgetting that they were once a Greek. They fought with the Spartans against Persians. And now they begin saying, we want Greece to be me. I should rule Greece. The moment that happens, tragedy begins. There is a Roman orator called Cicero. Um, Cicero once, in 63 BC, made a speech against his rival Lucius Catiline at the floor of the Roman Senate. Uh, Cicero said, Quousque tandem abutere Catilina patientia nostra? How long, Catiline, will you abuse our patience? I have abused all of your patience long enough today. Good job working. Good job. spoken very suspiciously <laughs> in the tongue. Fine. Uh, Socrates, by the way, would say that. Would say that uh, Greek and, let's put it this way, uh, pagan Greek ethics is not a, an ethical system wherein we're waiting for Saint Pete to give us wings and play the harp when we get to heaven, yes? Uh, you guys know what the Greeks believe once you die? What happens to you? If you're really lucky, you end up in the Elysian fields. If you're really, really lucky. You know, bright fields where you just hang around like hay all the time. I mean, who knows? Uh, if you're like most people, you die and your soul goes to Father Hades in the underworld. And what does it do there? It becomes a shadow and it floats around for eternity. The only sense you have is smell. Uh, the underworld sucks, basically, you know, along those lines. So to the Greeks, if the afterlife is so meaningless anyway, then the reward for goodness must come in this life, not the next. So according to Plato, what happens when we get our reward, yes, how we live a just life, you guys have read The Republic before? I don't want to repeat stuff that uh, you may have read. Okay. Plato breaks down the human soul into three parts. The lowest part of our soul are called the appetites. Things um, that belong to hunger, thirst, lust, those kinds of things. Bodily needs that we sort of crave. Middle level, drives. More emotional sort of faculties, ambition, want for honor, fame, that kind of stuff. And finally, at the highest level, the intellect. If you look at this triangle, appetites at the bottom, you realize that if you leave it alone, if that triangle decides what each of your actions are, the appetites will always win because there's the most of them. They're the majority of your soul. They're the broadest part at the bottom. Now you can ask yourself, what's so wrong about the afterlife? I mean, so the, uh, the appetites deciding what you want. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, as I've probably mentioned before, it depresses me to see those little broccoli symbols when I go to restaurants, yes? Uh, I'm particularly fond of a good burger. When I'm traveling, I usually find a place where they have really good burgers. It's nice comfort food. Uh, you know, it makes me feel not, I'm not away from home. Um, particularly fond of Carl's Jr. $6 burgers. They're pretty damn good. Uh, if I have one, if I'm hungry, okay, I'm full now. But then I could say, you know what, it tasted really good, I'm gonna have another. Oh, what the hey, you know, I'll have another too. If I don't check my appetites physically, then I kind of end up in the hospital, literally, in the case of eating too many $6 burgers, 18 bucks of pain uh, in, in that scenario. Um, it could also be a reference to if the appetites affected you in this way. Um, if you were ruled by your appetites and not your intellect or your drives, go to a party on the weekend and you see your best friend. You greet them the best way you know, kiss on the cheek, fist pump, chest bump, whatever you choose to greet your best friend. And then you say to yourself very quietly because you don't want your best friend to hear, damn, my best friend's date's really hot. And not, you don't only just say it, but you begin thinking, hmm, best friend, go get a beer at the bar. And I'm over here, and here's your date. Well, guess what? 
if you act on the appetites, tomorrow morning, you may feel pretty good tonight, but tomorrow morning you have one less best friend. You have let your appetites govern basically what your choices are. Pretty bad call, at least in that scenario. So according to Plato and Socrates, obviously, you need to have something ruling the soul. And the something ruling it would be reason. You need to temper basically these three parts of the soul. Reason added to the appetites gives you something very strange. You very seldom hear it worded today. It gives you temperance. The ability to say, no. That's my last shot of vodka. 16 shots of absolute in a bar in Singapore. Long story, bad breakup many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm drinking. Give me some coffee. Uh, it is the ability to control the appetites. It is also the ability to control the drives you have, the want for fame, to not do things. Oh, Lord. Um, one of my guilty pleasures watching television, aside from watching Cribs, which, which I find very interesting, is watching the tryouts for American Idol. I don't know why. It's like watching uh, accidents happen. But <laughs> well, when I see people who, I, I couldn't, myself, I couldn't carry a note if you gave me a, a bucket to carry that note in. When I see people who have no business singing, putting themselves out into the world and risking people, you know, not being very good. I think to myself, you know, you want fame so much, you're willing to pay for it with dignity. It's a rather high price to pay. But when we don't govern our desire for fame, that's sometimes what happens. By the way, sometimes the intellect as well, the intellect is not perfect. Robert Oppenheimer, who built the atomic weapon, yes, in New Mexico, in his writings, will comment when he sees the first bomb tested, not even used yet in Japan, but just tested. He will quote a Hindu holy book, the Mahabharata, and he will say, I have become Shiva, the destroyer of worlds. All of my knowledge, by the way, Oppenheimer has more knowledge about physics in his uh, cuticle of this pinky finger than I have in my entire body if I had five bodies. He's, that, he's really smart. But there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Big difference. Knowledge means the accumulation of information. That's all it is. It's like going to Costco and buying stuff. It's fun to go to Costco. Uh, wisdom, on the other hand, is the proper use of the knowledge you have. Now, when you say proper, that means there is a proper standard of how that wisdom should be used. Where it is, that's where it gets interesting. How do we find it? So the Greeks, to answer your question, to the Greeks, um, they believed their ethical system did not rely on an afterlife where you got rewarded or punished, but you could moderate yourself in this life. Therefore, my reward for being a good person is simply that I walk around as a just human being. It's not a spicy reward, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's as good as Plato and Socrates can give us. Questions? You guys are good? Good work today. We'll see you. Have a good week.